these are big picture, long-term factors that you do have to take into consideration and make a call on in, in one way or another. Yeah. And I'm willing to entertain the view that we are now in a different period uh, post COVID uh, that maybe was accelerated by the COVID experience itself, particularly in the US labor market. Mr. Lockhart, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. Glad to be with you today. The pleasure's all mine. So uh, forgive me, I'm terrible at small talk. I should, I should try and develop some, but can I maybe start with asking you about your views on inflation, unemployment, and Fed policy? Uh, how tough a job do you think the FOMC has right now? I think it's a difficult job. It's always a difficult job. The fundamentals at the moment uh, are pretty obvious. Uh, the economy is probably not in recession, but it's slowing and it's growing at a relatively uh, low pace or slow pace. Uh, obviously, inflation is elevated and has not really shown much of a an improvement. So we're still dealing with a, a very tough inflation problem. Uh, however, the employment market is very strong. So most people who want a job are employed, and there is an excess of job openings over people who are unemployed. So the employment picture is very uh, benign, but inflation is still a problem. And the Fed has to engineer a slowdown that doesn't get too bad. <laughs> and that that's not easy to do with the kinds of tools that central bankers have. Yeah, I'm, I, it seem, seems to me like a difficult job for sure. Um, do you think we've already seen the peak in CPI? Um, how persistent do you think inflation could be through this cycle? You know, I'm always hesitant to call a peak. Um, there certainly there are some signs that we've seen um, a peak in either the CPI or the PCE index. But, you know, inflation is influenced by shocks and we could have an energy shock over the winter, uh, uh, perhaps because of action by Putin or something to do with the energy situation in uh, Europe. So, you know, you have to be cautious about claiming that the worst is over from the point of view of accelerating uh, inflation. Having said that, it certainly is proving to be more persistent than the experts believed and expected. And there, in my mind, there are elements at work here that may make it uh, quite persistent, which makes the, the Fed uh, challenge all the more difficult. Those elements are, for example, uh, continuing supply chain problems. A uh, problems in terms of the supply of labor, which puts inflation pressure, or, uh, price pressure on labor or through through wages. Uh, those are just two uh, examples. Obviously, energy is somewhat volatile. We've even had weather events as well as the Ukraine war affecting food prices. So the, the short answer to your question is, Inflation could turn out to be persistent, and that makes, uh, you know, makes the Fed job just much, much harder. There was a, a really striking Nick Timoros piece uh, last Friday in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, I should really give a date. We're talking on uh, October twenty fourth, mm -hmm. um, and in that that piece had the, in the title line, some officials are signaling greater unease with big rate rises to fight inflation. The market naturally took this as some signs of uh, uh, the Fed reaching a approaching a pivot point. Was the market right to look at it like that? I think it's premature to draw that conclusion. It will depend very much on the inflation data that come in in, uh, in the next two or three reports. Um, I think there is a plausible scenario that the Fed uh, does a 75 basis point move at their November meeting and then possibly slows down a little bit and goes to a 50 basis point move at the December meeting. It will depend, as I just said, 
on how the data perform in the coming weeks. Uh, I do think that the, uh, you can tell from uh, Nick's uh, article, as well as from reading the minutes, that there are some people on the committee who are beginning to think that they've come a long way very fast, and it's time to begin to slow the rate hike process and let the lag effect take effect and have influence on the underlying inflation rate. This will be a debate, no doubt, at the November meeting. And uh, the most important point is their data dependent. So it will depend on what we see in the data in the coming weeks. You know, it's always a great issue because we get, we get to these points where the central banks are data dependent. But what kind of data would you look at if you were trying to predict uh, which way the Fed is likely to jump? Well, the, you know, the, the financial world, and for that matter, to some extent, the public understands that there is a target of 2%, and that's based on the headline PCE index data point. Uh, and then there's often commentary to the effect that that it's core PCE, which excludes energy and food, that is important. In my experience, while I was in the job, we actually looked at a dashboard. So you look, you know, I think the policymakers are looking at 15 or 20 different indicators and trying to draw a conclusion as to what is the kind of fundamental underlying pace of the broad price picture, uh, pace of growth of prices in the in the broad economy. That's quite literally hundreds, if not thousands of different prices that would be part of that uh, ideal index, if you yeah. will. And so they're, they're, they're looking at that. I think what they, they should be looking at now, what I would be looking at is the month over month numbers, as opposed to the full year numbers. When they, when the, press covers the latest inflation report, they often say, well, the prices are up X percent over the last 12 months. In my view, there's a lot of ancient history in that number. Sure. I am more interested in the current run rate of price pressure, whether it's whether price uh, inflation is accelerating or decelerating. So you take the month over month and annualize it, and that gives you a much more current sense of what's happening uh, in terms of inflation. And what the committee should be looking at, again, in my opinion, is uh, that question, are, is real-time inflation accelerating or decelerating, or is it just simply plateaued? So a shorter time frame, annualizing the current readings on a month-over-month -month basis, and from a broad set of inflation indicators. So it, now you say that, um, I'm, I'm reaching back into my head and trying to remember what I've seen recently. And the, the rough impression I got was that uh, goods prices were coming down. But mm -hmm. there's a sense in which that's kind of inevitable because we had so much uh, consumption of real goods uh, and uh, so much inflation in real goods, it's not surprising that we should see some, some hiatus in demand. Uh, people may have front-loaded a lot of purchases for when they were stuck at home with the kids. God knows I did. Um, anything they wanted to keep them quiet, I would buy them. So that's one thing. With services inflation, though, when I look across that, what I see doesn't reassure me. Um, and with uh, things like energy prices, I see vulnerabilities across across the energy complex everywhere. I've just found out last week, I live in Massachusetts and uh, it, I had no idea that liquefied natural gas was a component in our energy supply. But it turns out that in midwinter, in order to get enough gas into the state's grid, into network, we import liquefied natural gas from Canada. Um, this makes me quite nervous about where my electricity bill, my gas bill will end up. Um, is that... Are you seeing the same thing? Yeah. The, well, you, you started by pointing out, which is seems to be the case, that consumption patterns are shifting from goods to services. And uh, with the, let's just say, um, slowing demand for goods, 
many of those goods prices are coming down, but uh, overall inflation is being driven by services. Services includes housing services or shelter. Uh, that's one particular area of, of concern. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, energy is volatile. Uh, if I could be a little more speculative to, with this with this question, because I can't back it up with you know perfect, perfect data. Uh, energy permeates so many products in society. You mentioned liquefied natural, natural gas as a component of the uh, winter energy consumption in the Northeast. Well, natural gas is also part of fertilizer, and fertilizer is a major, uh, um, a major cost in, in agriculture, which affects food prices, broadly food prices. And if you take something like, for example, corn, corn oil, uh, is in some high percentage of uh, grocery store products. So you can see how volatile energy prices is not just a, a question of heating in the winter or gasoline in your car. It, 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 it's a, a component in everything that has to be transported and many things that have to be manufactured from uh, various commodity inputs. So energy, uh, if we have a volatile energy picture, it's, uh, it's likely, at least with a lag, to affect a broad set of prices and, and make the inflation picture murky at best. Absolutely. It's, it's hard to disagree. And it, it makes me quite nervous about where things are heading. Hi, I'm Raul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. One of the big questions, at least to me right now, is whether we see a slowdown in, in in key economic variables like inflation or unemployment or employment, I should say, uh, uh, before we see something unfortunate break in financial markets. As it is, we are seeing stuff break, uh, speech marks around the break. Uh, things weren't as smooth as they could have been back home in the UK. Uh, I have friends in emerging markets. That's a lot of emerging market debt and equities are trading very cheaply. And people are, you know, people are leaving that space because they can't make a living trading assets on it. What do you think is likely to break first, the real economy or the financial markets? Well, I'm tempted to say the financial markets because the fin financial markets are a discounting mechanism, at least in equity uh, equities. And um, you mentioned the word pivot earlier. Um, the Financial markets are highly sensitive to anything that looks like a pivot in policy that that maybe um, creates a, a new day, if you will, where interest rates have topped out. So the equity markets are uh, right now, of course, highly, highly sensitive to Fed policy and any indication that there is a uh, uh, that the Fed is coming off of the series of rate increases most recently at 75 basis points each time. What, what would they be discounting? Well, they'd be discounting policy and also discounting the real economy. And um, if the breakout, if you will, or the break that you're referring to is a break to a downside scenario, let, let us say a more severe recession than would be hoped for or expected. Um, no one hopes for a recession, but a mild recession would probably help with the inflation picture. If that were the case, then they, again, the financial markets would be looking for indications that that uh, bad scenario is, is actually playing out. And again, may probably lead the real economy in its reaction. So I, on balance, I see the financial markets coming first. Um, you mentioned emerging markets. You mentioned your home country of the UK. Uh, just in the last uh, few days, I have picked up a lot of discussion and concern about financial stability. 
mm-hmm. um, and about the, the the risk that so uh, so often is the case. Some small thing triggers a systemic problem worldwide. Um, the situation in the UK with the reversal of policy, but the market reaction in the gilt market to the unfunded tax cut. That's an example. It has not played out in the last two weeks as being necessarily a systemic event. But the underlying reality of pension funds that have over the last 15 years been reaching for yield and taking on certain kinds of risk, you know, that's going to be true in a lot of markets, the United States, the other advanced economies, and for that matter, the the, um, emerging economies. So we could have a very fragile system situation that we're dealing with. And uh, again, I just, I have to say in conversations as well as in the press, I've picked up sort of the third question, and that is financial stability. So it's interesting you mention financial stability. I, I would argue that the UK crisis we just saw was a financial stability issue and a financial stability issue caused by allowing pension funds to uh, use margined instruments to hedge liabilities where there are no margins. Mm-hmm. So they ended up finding themselves paying, making margin calls on financial swaps while the offsetting asset or the offsetting uh, factor were liabilities uh, that are not margined dropping in value. Um, And this is bad design. I think implicitly, you just pointed out, if the Fed's tightening rates, tightening financial conditions, we get to find out who is the weaker player in the market. Does the Fed have to tighten financial conditions still further? Uh, Good question. Um I guess it will, again, depend, I'll emphasize, it depends on what we see in the inflation numbers in the coming weeks. It depends on how persistent inflation actually turns out to be. It is a challenge because the Fed really only has one or two tools. Uh, The tool of the moment, of course, is the interest rate tool. And although I'm a little bit skeptical, frankly, of thinking in metaphors and letting metaphors drive your decisions. The metaphor of steering an ocean liner is one that actually I do think uh, pertains in this set of circumstances. And that is if inflation continues to be a problem, it doesn't seem to decelerate and therefore is persistent, then the temptation to oversteer with monetary policy is very clearly there. The Fed has taken responsibility for an inflation that has multiple causes, some of which are supply side, some of which are not monetary in nature. And yet the Fed has taken responsibility and its tools cannot address every underlying cause of our inflation problem. So they will perhaps, there's a risk that the Fed does too much yeah, in response to to bad inflation numbers, and then uh, we end up with uh, recessionary conditions that are worse than had to be. Your last answer made me think immediately. The word, the phrase "fiscal policy" jumped into my head mm-hmm. because it seems to me that a lot of the reasons why we're here is because fiscal policy may have been set too loose in the past. It may not be. It's an arguable point. I- do you, what are your thoughts on where fiscal policy is likely to take us over the next two years? Say? Hmm. Well, I mean, if you ask, you know, basic questions, are we going to go from in the United States from deficit to surplus? I'd put my money on deficit. I don't think I see the political will to address enough to address the spending to reduce the deficit. Does that, and that means sort of naturally the the debt level grows and the debt level is at a it's at a manageable but very concerning level today um 31 trillion was the last number that came out in terms of the national debt you have to look at the debt more as a question of the debt held by the public 
because the government itself owns its own debt in significant ways, the Fed being the, the biggest holder. That number of debt held by the public is about 24 trillion. That's about 100% of the size of the economy. Uh, this is not a comfortable position to be in. It's not, it's not tragic yet, or it's not uh, a catastrophe yet, but it, it's not a good position. And I don't see that deficit spending is going to be curtailed, quite frankly. So we have so much partisanship in, in the political system that I just doubt that Congress is going to come to grips with everything that would have to be done to bring that under control. So to a degree, the fiscal side will continue to be excessively supportive of of inflation, if you will, because that's really that correlates with with the fiscal stimulus that comes out of deficit spending. And uh, I think the, the, the central banks or the, or the Fed in this case is simply going to have to navigate a world in which they're not getting all the help that they could use from the fiscal side. It sounds to me as if they're being set up for failure. I mean, the choices they have are to tighten policy to a point which breaks financial markets to create uh, the sort of tightness in financial conditions to offset very easy fiscal conditions. And that problem isn't going to go away in a, in a two-year time frame. And I, I agree with you. I, I don't see any evidence of a, the political appetite for austerity here in the United States. If anything, it's almost suicidal politically. There's no party that can can set up a, 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 an austerity policy and hope to win elections. So if you have that set up, it's very difficult to really be optimistic that we're going to the the inflation problem, if it was domestically driven, would get addressed. Yes, and if you look at government expenditures, federal federal government expenditures, um, and you deal kind of with the fundamental fundamentals of that, it's entitlements. And with an aging population, the appetite for scaling back Social Security or uh, Medicare is, you know, Zippo. It's, it's, it's just not anything that a politician wants to come forward with, even though that's the underlying source is the entitlements that are almost two thirds of the overall uh, uh, um, federal uh, expenditures. So you know when you try to uh, apply austerity to the rest of the federal spending you're dealing with chicken feed really and and yeah. some of these some of these um departments that uh, their their budgets pale in comparison to social security medicare medicaid and defense you know uh, the rest is discretionary or defense is discretionary but Trying to do something there doesn't make a big dent in the problem. This is going to seem a weird question, but I wanted to ask you about banking supervisory issues. At MI2, we've recently received a couple of questions about whether or not there could be a loosening of the banking supervisory environment, some sort of a reform to make the current set of metrics that banks have to abide by a little bit more forgiving. People asked us about whether the SLR might be eased, for example. Mm -hmm. um, now, this puzzles me because I got no idea what the use of a banking supervisory regime, which is good up until a stressed environment is. It's like we, we, buying insurance, but then having the insurance have a clause which cancels it in the event of high winds. Um, <laughs> uh, am I thinking about this wrong? Is there a case to ease banking supervisory standards? Well, I'll give you I'll give you my personal take on on this. I um I, I always viewed the, the let's say the relative tightness of supervisory or regulatory controls as a pendulum, and a, and as a pendulum, it ought to swing with the health of the financial system and the economic backdrop or the outlook for the economy going forward. So in an ideal situation, um, the regulations that you put in place when there are storm clouds 
are different than the regulations when you have clear skies ahead and your underlying institutions in the financial system are in good shape. So what's the picture today? The institutions, the banking institutions are in good shape. Uh, they're, they're well capitalized and, and uh, there's not excessive new uh, bad loans being reported or, um, you know, they're not talking about a credit crunch coming in the future or a credit problem in terms of risk. So that aspect, I think, is, is, is positive. The economic outlook is quite murky, frankly. And if we ended up um, in a severe recessionary environment, clearly loan losses would rise. And that is something I think the regulators at this time have to take into consideration. I think the position or the attitude is at the moment, this is not a time to loosen the regulatory picture, or at least not too much. Um, but at the same time, this isn't 2008 or 2009, where you're reacting to a major failure in risk management in the system. I think risk is being managed on balance reasonably well. Now, from the Fed's point of view, of course, there is a new vice chair for supervision. Mr. Barr is his name, who came from the University of Michigan's public policy school. How, you know, his uh, approach will be very influential in how the overall Fed supervisors uh, view the picture. Um, and um, I think they're watching the situation carefully, partly because of financial stability risk and partly because of the economic outlook, um, but uh, probably are a little reluctant to loosen the tether on, on the banks at this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I don't see the banks as a likely uh, low nexus of the next financial stability issue um, for all sorts of reasons, mostly because they were so parsimonious in their credit habits recently. They haven't really been lending to, to bad credits or, or marginal credits. Um, where do you think, if you were looking for a financial stability concern at this point, where would you focus? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. Um, we talked earlier about the, the pension system, some of the financial transactions the pension systems have, uh, have taken in the last 10, 15 years, the search for yield that, that they had to deal with, with in, in, a, in a way, the, the very vexing problem of an aging population growing pension liabilities in a low rate money market environment. Um, you've got to find a way to raise more money to meet your future obligations. And that has been the challenge facing pension fund managers for for at least a decade or more. And uh, as we found out in the UK, there can be some surprises within the structure of uh, the balance sheets of those pension funds that no one paid much attention to. So that's one source. Uh, I, I continue to be a little bit worried about emerging markets, even though many emerging markets have floated their sovereign debt in local currency, not in dollars or in foreign currency over the last uh, decade or so. There still may be emerging markets that will hit the wall from the point of view of a debt crisis of some kind. It's not a great thing for the rest of the world that the dollar is so strong. Uh, for, for example, it, it compounds the cost of energy. That the dollar is rising at the same time that oil and gas prices are rising. You know, we, we in the United States buy, uh, to the extent that we buy oil and gas, we pay for it in our own currency, but the rest of the world does not do that. So emerging markets could also be a source and what we learned in 2007 and 2008 is 
something going haywire in a very obscure, relatively small financial market can have systemic effect by a kind of cascading of the reaction of risk managers of going from relatively bullish to overnight very cautious. And then that just cascades through the system. I can't tell you where it's going to come from. It will be a shock. And, um, you know, by definition, a shock comes from somewhere you didn't expect. Agreed. Um, so I, I see exactly what you see with regard to emerging markets. And I note with interest that even places like Mexico, uh, the banking system is not completely independent of uh, the dollar banking system. Um, the marginal flows of capital are important for countries like Mexico, a little bit less Brazil, for example, but they're important. Um, back in 98, uh, I was working in Moscow. So I had a very clear picture of exactly what you just described. And the feedback mechanism back to the United States and the financial markets in the United States it took a while to to manifest. Um, the tightening in policy happened in sort of like ninety seven, and we had the Asian crisis. Um, that didn't bring down any financial institutions in the U.S. and all these no significant ones. And it's only when the Russians ended up defaulting on their T bills on their GKOs. Yeah, and what was interesting, I, I think I have my history fairly clear that I could be wrong about this, but. What's interesting about that that Russian default is it it was felt in Argentina. Yeah, I remember re I remember reading an article at the time, and I said, "Boy, what's the connection between a Russian default and Argentine, you know, sovereign exposure?" But it was that strange linkage was very much in the markets at that time. Absolutely, same investor base. An investor that's gotten murdered in Russian debt has less capital to commit to Argentinian debt. Mm -hmm. um, there's a nexus, and the, the, these shocks communicate. Um, and that reminds me. So we, we were chatting a little bit earlier, and I, I in my, doing my minimum due diligence, and I wish it, I wish it was better than minimum, but it generally is minimum due diligence. I, I notice you'd worked, you have an FP, uh, foreign policy and an international economics background. And earlier in your career, you worked in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and in Iran. And you're probably one of the very few Americans left who've actually lived in both places. Um, outside well, it's, the state it's, it's, it's not so easy to live in both places if you're young. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have to be old like me to have lived in both places. Yes. Um, yeah, I, early in my career, I, I worked in the Middle East for what is today Citigroup, Citicorp, Citibank then. And um, and I ended, you know, I was a volunteer, so I went where they asked me to go. And they asked me to go to Saudi Arabia and then later to Iran. So I had both experiences. And I, you know, I tried to the best of my ability to stay up with um, what's happening in that part of the world. Um, and obviously, we live in interesting times in the Middle East, as we have been for decades. So what are your thoughts on, on Saudi policy at the moment? Why, why, is, why are the Saudis seemingly not sympathetic to U.S. requests to increase output? Well, um, you know, I only know what I read, and there are observers who have sources that are much closer to the people making decisions. And in Saudi Arabia and in their and their oil uh, policy, their OPEC policy. You know, I gather from from some of those articles that cert first uh, there's been a, a real chilling of relationship uh, between the United States and Saudi Arabia. That to some extent has to do with the Khashoggi uh, murder and. Um, the posture that some of uh, the United States took or probably had to take in some respects. After that, some of the pursuit of the nuclear deal is in the picture as well, the nuclear mm -hmm. deal with Iran. Yeah. And if you're living in that neighborhood, you may be very skeptical that that's going, the pursuit of that deal, uh, the resurrection, if you will, of that deal in terms of the U.S. involvement, is really going to bear any fruit and change Iranian behavior. So I think there is a view that the United States is going down a, a path that isn't helpful to Saudi Arabia and 
its rivalry with Iran. Um, and then I would say that uh, it appears that many of the decisions are highly personalized. They're, they're made by a single individual uh, or a very small group uh, in the kingdom. And, uh, you know, they can be influenced by uh, sort of the overall uh, feel of uh, the relationship at the moment. So, you know, there are, there are observers, uh, Karen Elliott House, who's pub publishes in the Wall Street Journal, has been uh, extremely knowledgeable for years and years. And I, I respect uh, what, what she writes about the, the, the situation. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, Friedman as well, the columnist for, uh, is very knowledgeable. So I think there are people who are close enough that they have a pretty good feel for what's affecting this decision. One thing that sometimes gets forgotten is uh, Saudi Arabia has had years of budget deficit and has its own fiscal challenges to some extent. Population is now well over 30 million in the kingdom. And so they, they may need the money. It may be as simple as they feel they need the money, quite sure. frankly. Sure. So, you know, so that's not to be forgotten. We think of Saudi Arabia as, you know, basically having a small population and a ton of money. But in fact, it's a pretty good sized country population wise now, uh, including all the expats that are in the country. And, uh, you know, they've had their own budget issues in the past. Yeah, I vaguely recall their budget was pred uh, predicated on an $80 oil price. There's not that much headroom there for them. Um, if, if they want to, you know, meet all the spending priorities they have in their budget. You know, my daughter lived there until last year, so I was sort of in touch with what life was like in the kingdom. And, you know, they've they've really modernized the, the, the country tremendously. Practically anything you want can be accessed in, in the kingdom. Uh, but they still have security issues that they're very concerned with. They're going through a transition. They see the handwriting on the wall long term regarding uh, uh, hydrocarbons and oil and gas as a basis for their economy. So, uh, you know, th th they have a sense of urgency as well. And I think that may feed into their desire to make as much as they can in the near term from their oil production. That's a great point. We're running a little short on time for various reasons. I thought I'd ask, start asking increasingly unfair questions. Um, this one, it's, I think it's a little unfair, but it has the advantage of, of giving a clearer summary of your views. So would you buy 30-year treasuries for your own account right now? Ah, interesting question. That is an unfair question. <clears throat> Um, and feel free not to answer unfair questions as a, a very a minimum. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm doing this a little off the cuff. It's not a question sure. that I, I've thought about a lot or prepared for. Um, but to the extent that the coupon is so much better than it was two years ago or five years ago, if I needed a current coupon income, I think this would be a good time to buy. Now, obviously, you're taking risk if you're going to hold the maturity. I doubt that I'm going to be around in 30 years to see the maturity of these bonds. So I would have to pay some attention to the potential of a capital loss in buying 30 years. But if you're the thrust of your question is, is, is this a time to get some exposure for income purposes to U.S. Treasuries, it does strike me as a good time. I think there is a plausible scenario that if not peak rates, we've seen high rates and that that we're not going to, there's no point in holding out for another 200 or 300 basis points in long-term long treasuries. I think you could make that argument. A lot will depend on the economy and on inflation, but you can make that argument. Having said that, um, you know, I'm a pensioner now, and yeah. my pension is is enough to cover my personal expenses. So the other answer to your question is, I'm still fully invested in equities. You ah, know, that's uh, also very interesting. That's you know, I, yeah. I 
I mean, I don't even follow the rules of asset allocation. I'm just fully invested in equities, trying to build an estate that I hope, some of which I hope to be able to pass on. You know, I, th I think uh, the reason why I ask those deeply unfair questions is because sometimes it's really hard to summarize what a view means, what, what the, the, all of your view on the current economic conditions and current circumstances are. Because you can make a load of points about, oh, inflation could go higher. And so, but if you're going to buy 30-year bonds, you probably don't think those risks dominate. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, you know, you, you're asking a question. I, I might put it a little differently. Uh, you have to boil everything down to go long or go short. Right. You know, are you going long the United States or short the United States? Are you going long the treasury market or short the treasury market, long equities or not? Um, you know, and I think we'll work our way through this. Um, there are certainly some headwinds, demographic headwinds, energy transition that is going to in, inevitably create headwinds. Um, you know, you can make arguments that the future is not only problematic, but also uh, biased toward either inflation or biased toward weak growth. But given the alternatives, I'm still long <laughs> as opposed to short. Uh, you know, I think that's a really helpful way of, of, of kind of giving some more texture to your thinking. So I, I'm, I'm grateful. And I've got to tell you, I was recently discussing a similar question, this, this time on, say, 30-year tips. Would, mm -hmm. You know, is now a good time to buy tips? And I was quibbling in my usual angels on the head of a pin sort of way of a colleague of mine who's got a far more broad brush perspective on markets. And he said, what are you waiting for? These things are on half price sale. They've dropped from one one fifty to to seventy five. Why you? Why would you not buy that? And mm -hmm. you know what? I th I thought for about for sixty seconds and went. You know, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely right. What What is the big picture question? How bad do I think bad's going to be to make me avoid these? Given that I'm I'm not as young as I could be either, frankly. Yeah. If you um, if you if I could put a thought in your head, I, because I mull this one over and I read smarter people than me have written books on uh, the disinflationary era versus the inflationary era, and I'm willing at least to 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 uh, consider that the argument that COVID represented a kind of change of times, a change of era from one that was disinflationary where the problem was getting inflation up to one in which there are structural elements that are uh, headwinds or, or that support uh, price pressure, upward price pressure. Charles Goodhart comes to mind, for example, in, in his book of a couple of years ago. Yeah. And these people point to demographics, which is relatively measurable and, you know, pretty clear what's going to happen over the next 50 years. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the climate situation needing to be addressed in some way, which many people believe would be a transition to a a uh, low carbon environment, if not if not entirely to a no carbon environment. Um, these are big picture, long term factors that you do have to take into consideration and make a call on in, in one way or another. Yeah. And I'm willing to entertain the view that we are now in a different period uh, post COVID. Uh, that maybe was accelerated by the COVID experience itself, particularly in the U.S. labor market. I, I've got to say that was a, such a wonderful point to end on because there's so much food food for thought there. Uh, Mr. Lockhart, it's a pleasure, and I hope we can do this, have another conversation like this sometime. So do I. Thank you so much. So I got a lot out of the discussion with Mr. Lockhart. Um, first of all, he reminded me that the Fed does not operate in a vacuum and that the fiscal policy environment is not necessarily doing the Fed any favors. Um, worth noting that a policy mix of easy fiscal and tight monetary has always tended to turbocharge the dollar. Um, Mr. Lockhart seemed pessimistic about the chances of any fiscal rectitude breaking out anytime soon in Congress. Um, secondly, 
In his comments on Saudi Arabia, he reminded me that the Saudis have their own problems as well, and that they have budget priorities too. So we shouldn't be so surprised that their focus is a bit different to the United States' focus. And finally, while he was concerned about inflation, his pessimism didn't amount to a call to sell long bonds or equities at these levels. His longer-term perspective appeared to be net bullish despite the challenges the United States faces. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.